Now, I'm going to explain to you uh, exactly what it is I now think. I'm going to talk to you from within this system. I'm going to explain to you how it all is. And I'm going to remind you that there is a place in you that already knows everything I'm going to say, as you'll understand in a minute. What the teacher wrote on the slate, the first thing he wrote was, desire is a trap, desirelessness is moksha or liberation, desire is the creator, desire is the destroyer, desire is the universe. Desire is a trap, desirelessness is moksha or liberation, desire is the creator, desire is the destroyer, desire is the universe. You recall Buddha's Four Noble Truths? Buddha went and sat under the, the Bodhi tree in Budgaya for seven days, and he saw how it all was, and then he came back to teach. And he said, who will I teach? And he thought, well, gee, I'll lay it on the guys I used to hang out with when I was doing austerities. And they were at Sarnath at the Deer Park, and he went there, and they were all bugged with him because he was no longer doing austerities, because he wasn't being pure like they were. And so when he came along, they said, let's ignore him because he's not on the trip anymore. But he came up and he was all shiny and light was coming out of him. And so they found themselves, in spite of themselves, honoring him. And he sat down and he said, uh, they said, we're not going to listen to you though, because you don't do the thing anymore. He says, well, I'm enlightened now. And they said, yeah, but you don't do the thing. He said, but I never before told you I was enlightened and now I'm telling you I'm enlightened. And I'm going to tell you how it is. And then he proceeded to lay on them how it is with four truths. Truth number one, all life is suffering. That's a hard one. What does that mean? Birth involves suffering, death involves suffering, sickness involves suffering, old age involves suffering, not getting what you want involves suffering, getting what you don't want involves suffering. And he says even getting what you want involves suffering because it's in time and it's going to pass away. Say you want to be the playmate of the month, you become the playmate of the month, and next month you're not the playmate of the month anymore. Lay not up treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt, was Christ's way of saying it. Problem is, if it's in time, you're going to lose it. So even getting what you want has an element. It's like riding a wave on surfing. The wave's going to end, even in endless summer. His second noble truth was the cause of suffering is craving or desire. If you didn't crave life, you wouldn't fear death. You wouldn't suffer. If you don't crave something, you can't suffer about it. The third noble truth is, if you give up craving, you end suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the eightfold path or the means of giving up craving. Giving up craving, giving up desire. Now my teacher, who is a Hindu, is saying to me, desire is a trap, desirelessness is liberation. Desirelessness is liberation. What does all that mean? What it means is extricating oneself from attachment. It means, quote, renunciation. And what does renunciation mean? To us Westerners, it means a guy like Milarepa sitting in a cave where he's been eating green nettles and he's covered with nettle fur and he looks like a bag of bones and, and you've got to give up everything. Well, it has nothing necessarily to do with that at all. Because what is required on this trip is renunciation of attachment. Renunciation of attachment. Dropping out, not in the external sense, but in the internal sense. It doesn't matter what the external trip is. Any one of them will do. It's the internal process that changes. Hmm. Now, how do you do that, and what is that about? And how can I tell you how Maharaji reads my mind? Take this meditation. Remember I read you that thing about the 17-year-old Ramana Maharshi? Ramana Maharshi is, does Gyan Yoga, the yoga of the mind beating out the mind. It's like Zen. And he says, do the following. He says, just do it relentlessly. Sit down and follow the method of vichara atma, the method of self-inquiry. Sit down, you say, who am I? 
And then you say I until you have I placed in the middle of your head and you can hear it in there in the middle of your head. I, 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 I. I'll just take you quickly through it. We won't do it at this moment. You say, I am not this body. And then you experience your torso as object and I as subject. I in the middle of your head. Then you say, I am not my five organs of motion. Then you experience your arms as object, your tongue as object, your legs as object, your anal sphincter as object, your genitals as object. With the eye in the middle of the head as subject. You note them all. You note your arm doing its thing. You note it. Then you say, I am not my five senses. Now, you've all been in the situation where you're in a room where a clock is ticking, and you start to read something, and you get so involved in what you're reading, you don't hear the clock tick. And then you finish reading, and suddenly the clock is ticking again. Well, that's an involuntary example. You see, the clock continued to tick, your ear continued to hear the clock tick, but you were no longer attending to your ear hearing the clock tick. So at this point, you don't turn it off, you just note your ear hearing, your eye seeing, your nose smelling, your tongue tasting, your skin feeling. Then you say, I am not my five internal organs, and you go through respiration and breath, and you digestion and excretion and perspiration and, uh, and circulation. Each of them, you either fantasy it or experience it as object. And then you come to the stinker, the clincher, the powerful one the key to the whole thing. When you've done all that, and it may take you months to get to that place, then you say, I am not this thought. The th what thought? The thought of I. I am not that thought. And you begin to see your thoughts as if you were looking at a ticker tape news thing going by you. I am not this thought. What thought am I not? The thought of I. Here I am. Where's here I am? Here I am is over there. Where am I? Where am I? And if you can play this one out, at that point you have gone behind your senses and behind your thinking mind. And you pass through a doorway. And you enter into another state of consciousness. And another state of consciousness is discontinuous with your normal waking state of consciousness. William James, the philosopher, said, Our normal consciousness, our normal waking consciousness, is but one special type of consciousness. Whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie other types of consciousness quite different, each having its own field of application and adaptation. No account of the universe in its totality is complete, which fails to take into account these other types of mentality. But how to consider them is the question, for they are so discontinuous with our normal waking state of consciousness. And so on. And you go through a doorway at that point into another state of consciousness. Now, if you are able to do that, where is it you go to? You go into a thing which is called samadhi. That's one name for it. You go into a low level of samadhi, and there are eight or nine stages of this. Keep that in mind for a moment, and let me introduce another metaphor to you, a metaphor in the Western framework. Think of a solid object, mass, as a pattern of energy. We know that. We're hip, sophisticated people. We know that. We know that though this... Uh, this seems solid. It is, in fact, a pattern of slowed-down light. It just seems solid to our particular sense receptors. Now imagine, if this, is a, if this is a pattern of energy, then light is also a pattern of energy. Sound is a pattern of energy. Thought is a pattern of energy. And what, then, is energy? And you get into a finer and finer form of energy because behind that one there's another one, and behind that one there's another one, and behind that one is another one. And you finally get down to the state of energy that is so fine, it is no longer unique. It's no longer unique. That is, 
If you think of an atom as having electrons and neutrons and so on, protons, even the electron, which has a uniqueness to it, is made up of some of these, a pattern of these finer things. And the quality of these finer things is that they are every, anything you can label, call it vacuum, call it space, call it ashtray, call it, uh, call it thought, call it emotions, call it Mars, it's all this made up of this same thing. Are you with me? You got the image? If you are now aware that every, behind everything there is this very fine energy and it's all interchangeable and it's constantly moving in and out of everything, you begin to understand that we are, we are a solid. This is solid. It's all solid. This is made up of that energy. This is made up of that energy. That flame is made up of that energy. Tomorrow is made up of the energy. Yesterday is made up of the energy. And it's all just interchanging. And it's not unique at all. Now, the thing, the next statement that is worthy of some reflection is that that type of energy, which is the finest form of energy that is in the world of form, what's called prakriti, or many names, that very fine form of energy is an identity with, not equal to, but an identity with consciousness. Not self-consciousness, but consciousness. That means that when you extricate yourself from the time-space locus of this body, these thoughts, this set of senses, you, what you call me, that I that I experienced when I first took psilocybin, the Ramana Maharshi experience when he thought he was going to die, that I that has nothing to do with this body, this personality, this whole trip. What is that? That is that energy. And it is known in Sanskrit as Sat Chit Ananda. You enter into a state of Sat Chit Ananda. And Sat Chit Ananda means absolute existence, absolute knowledge, and absolute bliss. Now, that's a big one. And let me just clarify who you really are. Because you may want to know just what it means to be God. Take Ananda. That's a groovy one to take, bliss. You go surfing. You get to just that place on the wave where it's all perfect. You've just got the wave. You're just riding the, the place in the wave, perfect. Yeah, right, here we are. Wow, oh, is that good. It's that timeless moment. You're right there. You paint a picture and you get to the place where the picture is just coming out itself and it's perfect. It's just the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, right. You're doing a scientific research project and you see a relationship. Oh, wow. Yeah. You get a degree and everybody's proud of you. Oh, yeah. You get a moment of that, mm, that thing again. That feeling for a quick second, it's all right. Yeah. Oh, mm, it's so good. The method that most Westerners are most uh, familiar with for getting to that little place is, of course, the sexual experience. Because at the moment of orgasm, you transcend, if albeit briefly for most Westerners, you transcend your ego. And it becomes merely an experience in which there happen to be four legs and four arms and two heads and movement. And you are part of an experience. And there is a moment in there when you say, yeah, well, oh, right. I just like to stay right at this place forever. Mm. You all know the place? It's called fulfillment. It's called contentment. It's called a feeling of well-being. It's called it's all right with the universe. It's called, yeah, it's called isness. We got lots of names for it. It's unnameable. It's a state. It's a state of being. It has nothing to do with doing. It's a state of being. It's a moment. It's an eternal moment. It's outside of time. That place which you identify with your method of getting there. So if you're a surfer, you say, baby, all I want to do for the rest of my life is surf. And if you're a sexual gymnast, you say, oh, man, all I want to do is make out forever or whatever your particular turn-on method is to get you to that place. 
And when you say, you turn me on, or that scene turns me on, you mean it allows me to touch that place again. But the funny thing is that the place is inside of you. The place is not connected with your method. It's not out there. When you say you fall in love with somebody, it means that they are a stimulus which turns you on to that place. Now you've got to understand that Satchit Ananda means living in that place all the time. Okay? When I try to figure out where Maharaji, what state of consciousness he's in, I begin to understand he's in what's called Sahaja Samadhi. He is living in a state of perpetual, total, ecstatic sexual union with the entire universe at every moment. Is that enough? That's known as Ananda. Chit, which means absolute knowledge. He sits there absolutely mindless. There's not a thought in his head. He's not sitting around thinking, I think I'll lay on him about his mother's spleen. That'll really blow his mind. (laughs) There's no ego there at all. He's just absolutely sitting there mindless. And out of my needs comes that particular thing. And here is the extraordinary issue of what renunciation or surrender is about, because it's so beautiful. He is sitting there mindless, and out this thing comes. In other words, he has become that kind of energy, so he is my mother's spleen as well as everything else in the universe. It's all interchangeable, it's all interrelated, it is all one, it's known as the clear white light in some systems. It is a complete homogeneous field in which when you're hooked up, you're in it all, you are it all, that's what Chit is. But the point is, he doesn't know he knows because there's nobody around to know he knows. You hear that? You give up knowing you know to be it all. And the surrender is the surrender of the guy who knows. And the Westerner is not about ready to do that because he wants to know he knows. And what the Westerner is on is what's known as the asymptotic curve of the subtle sphere. It's a curve that never meets the place, but it sucks you in further and further and further because you almost know you know. You get very far out. You see so much. You begin to see... I had a friend, Aldous Huxley, who was in one of these places. And finally, he was down to practically one word. I mean, he had a a beautiful command of language, but he was, everything was blowing his mind all the time. And he was going around and all he'd say was, extraordinary. (laughs) Everything he would look at, anything, extraordinary. (laughs) He was seeing how it all was, and he was gassed by seeing how it all was. But finally, you've got to give that one up too, you see. And the problem, the thing that's so interesting is when you start to go into samadhi, the first thing you go into are these waves of bliss like you've never had before. Oh, God, it's so good. Oh, boy. And why not hang out here, man? This is pretty good. But the Vedas say, keep going, baby. Don't stop now. The problem is you've got to give up the experiencer. The experiencer of bliss is still separate from the bliss, and finally you become the bliss. The knower is separate from the knowledge. Finally you give up the knower to be the knowledge. The here and now is separate from he who is thinking about or experiencing the here and now, so finally you give up him. It is surrender. But the rules of the game say that you can only surrender when there is no surrender. That is, if you think you're giving something up, forget it. Forget it, because you can't do it. For example, I am, I am a practicing yogi, and I love root beer. Now, root beer is not listed by the Vedas as one of the foods that yogis eat. And I am a beginner on the trip. I am in the first of many years of training, and I still like root beer. 
Now, I can sit in my meditation room and I can look so holy, butter would melt in my mouth. I mean, I really look like Buddha himself. Except all the time I'm thinking about root beer. <laughs> well, if I'm thinking about it, I might as well drink it. But every time I drink it, I strengthen the, the whole habit of drinking it. But if I don't drink it, I sit and think about it. So sometimes I'm sitting in the meditation room and I'm just sitting and I'm very zonked out. And the next moment I notice I'm at my father's refrigerator holding a bottle of root beer drinking it. And at first I go through, oh, damn it, you're drinking root beer again. And then I see that putting myself down for drinking the root beer is just another form of attachment too. Ramana Maharshi says, instead of sitting around wailing and saying, alas, I am a sinner, get on with it. If you spend all that energy doing your thing, you'd all be enlightened. So all you can do is develop a place in yourself which is called the witness, which notes it, which says, there he is drinking root beer. There he is putting himself down for drinking root beer. <laughs> this is what is known as karma yoga. Because what extricating yourself from desire and attachment doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you stop having the desires or in some ways fulfilling them. It means you stop being identified with he who is having the desires. If I am not my body, that every time I make the statement, I am sleepy, I am hungry, these are lies. You understand that? Do you understand what is required then? What is required is a complete reorganization of your entire thought process. Because you're thinking from one vantage point, and if you're going to make it, you've got to be thinking from another vantage point. You've got to change your perceptual viewpoint, your cognitive conceptual core, thing, and all those funny words. And yoga is a technique. Yoga means union. It is a technique designed. All the different yogas, and there are many different yogas, are each designed to take you and to work with various aspects of your being to take you to the place where you are in this other vantage point. Because our problem primarily is that our minds are completely out of control. Absolutely out of control. Vivekananda likens our minds to drunken monkeys. I mean, you just think of what's happening to your own thoughts at this moment. You listen to me for a moment, you're aware you're hot, you think about the time, you feel your body, you feel perspiration, you wonder about something, your thought goes off somewhere else, you're aware you're next to a neighbor, you think about later, you remember before, you wonder what use this will be to you. I mean, I can pick up thousands of things, and you know, all of, we're all thinking lots and lots and lots, and they're just going by just like that. And the funny thing that has happened in the West, and now in the world, is that the rational mind, which is the highest tool that man has for gaining enlightenment, is also the most powerful trap, it turns out. And what has happened is our minds, which are in effect servants, have become masters. I mean, if at this moment, um, a naked girl walked out of that room and walked up here, your, all your consciousness would be copped. Just take all your consciousness with you. Maybe one person here would be able to just keep right on with, you know, here we are. Huh? And, and yes, and that too, and here we are. Everybody would go on the trip because you're completely at the whim of your stimulus input. You are your senses. You are your thoughts. And the game is to calm your mind down so that you are no longer your senses and your thoughts. In that way, you are free of them, and then they become the servants they were meant to be, and you can use the exquisite response mechanism that is the brain and thought for what it's supposed to be used for, without it running the ship. If you went to Salon to become enlightened, and you went into a Theravadan monastery, you would walk in and you'd say, I want to become enlightened, you see. And they'd say, well, that's very nice. And they'd take you to a little room. You'd go into the room and they'd say, now, would you notice that when you breathe in, your abdomen goes up. And when you breathe out, your abdomen goes down. And you, yes, I noticed that. Continue to notice that. Thank you. They leave you. Food's brought to you. Two weeks later, 
Guy comes in. How are you doing? Doing with what? You've been watching your abdomen go up and down? Oh, I watched for you. Didn't you mean I was put. Thank you very much. That's the work. All right, now let's say your only assignment in life see, is to watch your abdomen go up and down. And every time it goes up, you think rising, and every time it goes down, you think falling. That's your job. See, like I do this every morning. Right? I sit in meditation, and I start out. And since I'm a high Western achiever, I count. See? And I know how hung up I am when I begin, so I know I'm going to have to do 500 to get straight today. Or a thousand to get straight today. Om one. Om two. Om three. Om four. What an idiotic thing to be doing. Om five. Om six. Jeez, my leg hurts. Om seven. Om eight. I should have gone to the bathroom before. <laughs> Om nine. Om ten. Om eleven. Do you think this works? Om twelve. For this, I got a PhD. Om thirteen. And on and on and on. Now, what happens is, I'm just giving you the little thoughts you can flick off, see? But the really seductive ones, they really take you on the trip, you see? Like, uh, you hear, there's a noise outside, and you say, what was that? See, and that seems like a legitimate reason. And you can keep right on counting, and you're thinking about what is it, and who is it, and that leads you to that thing, and I've got to get the car greased, and you're off and running, see? Okay. And then you wait, oh, wow, I was supposed to be counting to five. <laughs> um, suddenly at 93, how did I get here, see? Don't knock yourself, that's just more jazz. 94, 95, 96. And then pretty soon you get so that the breaks are only like about 60 instead of 100, you see, where you forgot. Okay. And you keep pushing it down and pushing it down and pushing it down. You take this most mechanical, stupid thing, see? That's exactly what you need to foil the mind, is just simplicity itself. And your game is to treat all thoughts like clouds. There is not one thought worthy of having at that during that period of time other than rising and falling, or you're counting. Okay? And after a while, when you really get good at it, you get down to a place where all there is is that place in your abdomen going up, coming down, going up, coming down, going up, coming down. And in your head is rising, falling, rising, falling rising, falling. But before that happens, you get to the point where you see the thousands of thoughts going by, just like clouds in the sky, just going over. But the thing is that because of your commitment, they have no leverage to hold you. While previously, every thought had as much right as every other thought to hold you. Why did you give preeminence to one over another? And it's only when you can make your mind thoroughly one-pointed, bring it down to one place, this is the first requirement of this game. First requirement of the game is to bring the mind down at one point. And then the game is to work with the energies in the body and learn how to control them and move them up your spine and through your nerves and so on. And then you turn, push the energy through that one point in this and turn the one point in this back in on itself and you go through the doorway. So what the game is, is you go from many subjects and many objects to one subject and many objects to making that subject object and it all becomes subject. You grok it all. Right? You are one with it all. That's the root. That's the root of Gyan Yoga, the yoga of the intellect. You see, when you've been getting high lots and you know where high is, Highville, Heliopolis, uh, you know, the place, Satchitananda, you know that it has certain qualities. One is that it is not in time. It is not in time. It's in eternal time. The other is that it's not in... There is no subject and object. There's no subject and object. So if you want to create the universe of high to live in, you've got to work with time and you've got to work with subject-object. Uh, I'm just giving these as clues. We won't get into that at the moment. Except to say this, that the first... 
purification things in what I'm doing include the first one is non-killing, non-stealing, non-lying, non-giving and receiving of gifts and sexual continence. We, the continence one is too big a topic to play with at this moment. But let's take to the others because they all fit together. If I have anything going in my head that keeps you him, we cannot be high together. Because if we're going to be high together, we've got to be us. And as long as there is subject-object, it won't work. Now imagine what it is like to live in a world where everybody is us. Everybody is us. There's no them at all. There's no them at all. It's a big one. This is a very big one. This is a very big clue. It's a clue. It is a clue. Time and subject-object are two major clues becoming a conscious being at this moment. Take sex. There are three levels at which you can have sex. There is Sam and Mary making it with each other. Your personality turns me on. An interpersonal thing. Are you happy? Was it fun? Did you enjoy it? Etc. We're having fun together. There is the yin-yang, the level of polarization of forces, the biological magnetic fields. Both of those are subject-object. Those are both what the Easterners mean by the word lust. That is, desiring something in the subject-object sense. There is a third level at which the two of us become one, and from this one place, one consciousness and two bodies, then we perform a dance and that dance creates the energy which we feed in to keep us as one. You hear that? That's very, very high stuff. Very high stuff. Very high stuff. Anything in you which makes you see somebody else as him or her is the reason you're not high all the time. Is the reason you are not conscious all the time. Consciousness all the time means total compassion for how it is in the universe at every moment. Compassion means total empathy with how it all is. It means grokking it. Just as you understand how your hand works, you understand how it all is because you are it all because your ego is not getting in the way, because your desires are not distorting what it's all about because you are not identified with your desires. If you are horny and walk down the street, all you see is what's makeable. If you're hungry and we walk down the street, all you see is what's edible. If you're an achiever and you walk down the street, all you see is who's competitive with or what you can achieve on, about. Desires, motives affect perception. And we know that from social psychology. The only thing in social psychology that we don't know is that there's an out. I was teaching from a social psychology book, which was a good, respectable social psychology book just seven years ago, that said man is the sum of his social roles. Wow. It's rough karma. See, and the funny, peculiar position we're caught in is that many of us have touched a possibility and we are awake to how beautiful it is and we want it to be beautiful but we want it so bad that our want, our desire, corrupts our efforts. That's the situation we find ourselves in. Because it is as obvious as the nose on one's face when you look at protests that the protesters create the people who just against whom they protest. That as long as you are identified in the polarity and attached at the polarized position, you create your polar opposite. If I see you as him, that puts into you a reaction that sees me as him, and there we are, separate. And only can I say, I disagree with you when I understand that you and I are one. And that's the basis from which I'm working. Only when you can say, yes, Richard Nixon is us, and J. Edgar Hoover is us, and, and Mao is us, and Cho Min is us, and on and on and on. And the hippie is us, and the speed freak is us, and the heroin addict is us, and the psychotic is us. Then we can get on with it. It's a reversal of figure and ground. It's going from the position where you are completely addicted to individual differences, which is what the Western trip is. 
to the point where you, and I use Western trip only to mean rational materialism. It is not unique to the West, except it's the Greek Roman trip. Except for some of the mystical elements in Plato and Heraclitus. And, so and as long as you're into individual differences, you're into subject and object. And you flip it over and you see in which they are all the same. I'm driving along in New York State and a policeman stops me because I've got a very old 1938 car and it looks weird and I've got a long beard and I look funny and I've got a funny license plate and it's all strange and there's a stop and frisk law and so he stops me and he comes up and he says license and registration and he is being him, he's being policeman. What I am doing is doing my mantra, I'm doing a centering device, a heuristic device for keeping me centered in the place where we are one. And I hand him my license and registration, and at the same moment, I am here. I am not identified with him who is handing the license and registration. Right. This is going to be very pure, or it doesn't work, I'll tell you, by the way. I don't come on to him to look how beautiful I am, I'm a flower child, or, you know, why are you a policeman? Come on, be groovy. I no, no hustle. I don't say a word. We never miss a, a step in the Lila Rasa, in the divine dance. He's doing his policeman thing. I'm doing my far out unusual person. I'm just kindly giving him my license. And he says, do you have any guns in the car? And I say, no, I don't have any guns in the car. Any drugs in the car? No, I don't have any drugs in the car. What's in that? I say, these are some mints. Would you like a mint? And all the time, I'm right here, right here. It's a psychic place. It is not, it's a vibrational rate, by the way, I'm talking about. I am right here. And after about three minutes, he begins to dig he's in the wrong place. Because he's busy being a policeman. But the fact is that all of us are busy with our melodramas. We're all in Peyton Place, you see. But behind our roles in Peyton Place, which were just determined by central casting for the evening, I, you were there a lot of parts for audience tonight. Who wants to play? Right. Come over as audience. All right. We need one holy man left over from Christmas. Right. <laughs> the end of the evening, take your bread and go home. It's all over. Great. We played our parts well. Everybody playing their part? Are you busy listening? Right. Watch it. Don't get caught. Just because you're going to play Hamlet, don't be Hamlet. Because here we all are. All of us are right here in a place where we are noting him speaking and their, him listening and her listening. You can be in the melodrama or you can see the melodrama going down and here we all are too, right? This is a psychic space. I'm just doing my... Inside, the funny thing is all the time I'm talking to you, I'm not talking to you at all. I mean, it's very far out and it may, you may feel gypped. He never came that night. <laughs> Watch it. Because <laughs> inside, all I'm doing is all money, fed me, hung out, 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 money, fed me, which I've been doing for about a year and a half. And it's going on in my bowels, and I'm, it's like inflating a room inside me where I am. It's like a cave. It's a groovy heart cave. It's called a Hridayam, and I hang out in the cave, and I hang out with Buddha, with Christ, with Ramakrishna, with Ramana Maharshi, with anybody else that wants to come out of their melodrama and be in the cave. It's not located in time and space. And here I am, and I'm watching this whole thing go down. I'm watching him speak. So I'm with the policeman, and pretty soon he begins to sense that there is a nicer place to be than where he is. Right here. And all I can say is, as I drove away, which is very unlike state troopers, he was waving at me, saying, Goodbye, Richard, have a good trip. Because finally, we're dealing with the variables that concern just humanness. They don't concern individual differences anymore. The, the, the toughest deputy sheriff in the southern community in the United States, the meanest guy that eats nails, still wants to live in love. He wants to live in warmth. He wants to live in beauty. He wants to feel that feeling. 
and what technology and what our rational materialism and what the manifestation of all of our thought has led us to believe is that through gratification of the senses and through the thinking mind we would get to that place but finally we begin to realize it's not going to make it and at that point it starts to fall away and then you start to go inside and then you find out lo and behold in here here we all are again except we're really here we're really here. We're really here. All the Westerner needs is the faith in the possibility of a higher state of consciousness to equal the faith he has had in his rational mind. And slightly greater than that in order to allow him to do the next step. Without that faith, nothing can happen. It's got to be a faith which undercuts the cynicism. The cynicism says there's nothing more than this round, baby, so take what you can get. Because when you die, you're dead. You die, you're dead. But who, in fact, we are has nothing whatsoever to do with that. It's very much like you were in a factory in Detroit and you drove out of the factory or a factory that makes cars and you drove out of the factory and the door closed on the factory and you found yourself in the existential predicament, except you didn't know who you were because everything you forgot, when the door closed, you forgot everything preceding that. So all there is is this car. And the, the gate opens and you drive on the road and for years you drive on the roads and you stop at gas stations and drive-ins and so on. And if somebody says, who are you, you say, I am a Chevrolet Corvair. And you look at fields, but you can't go there because you break your springs. And when you go by those car lots where they take cars and they make them in little steel squares, you get uptight because planned obsolescence and all. And then a voice comes along and says, uh, hey, buddy, did you ever see that? I say, what's that? That's a door handle. What's that for? Well, that's to get out of the car. What do you mean, get out of the car? Who? I am a Chevrolet Corvair. Come on now, what are you doing putting me on? No, man. <laughs> that's the illusion. That's the illusion that keeps nature doing its dance. You can open the door and get out. That's exactly the way it is. Exactly the way it is. And remember, this has nothing to do with what you do in the external world. Don't get into funny places about it's not socially responsible. Because uh, whoever it is that's sitting here is sitting here doing his thing. Uh, got here on time? <laughs> He's a renter robot. I move him from place to place. He's like Charlie McCarthy doll. I watch with awe as this terrible beauty of nature goes down. All of it. All of it. Life, death birth, love, hate, all the polarity. You know, it's another identity with energy and consciousness is the word love. An exact identity. In fact, when you get to the top of the pyramid, they all become one. That's what Plato's pure idea is. That's that place back up there. Love, energy, consciousness, truth, beauty, wisdom, it all becomes one at that place. Meha Baba says, very beautiful Saint from India. Love has to spring spontaneously from within and it is in no way amenable to any form of inner or outer force. Love and coercion can never go together, but though love cannot be forced on anyone, it can be awakened in him through love itself. Love is essentially self-communicative. Those who do not have it catch it from those who have it. True love is unconquerable and irresistible, and it goes on gathering power and spreading itself until eventually it transforms everyone whom it touches. Being is dying by loving is a true statement. That is the statement of bhakti yoga, the yoga of love, of devotion. If you ever have experienced being so in love with somebody that you are more concerned about their happiness than your own, you loved yourself right out of your egocentricity. You understand bhakti yoga. 
Because the minute you turn that to loving in another person or in the universe that which is universal rather than that which is finite. You don't love Mary because she's Mary and you don't love Mary because she's got a beautiful bod. You love Mary because she's God. And you honor her and worship her and you're making love to her as a form of worship and everything else you do all day long in everything 24 hours a day is a form of worship of making the profane sacred. That's what it's all about. You want to be high, just change your consciousness around. You want it bad enough, you'll do it. It's work, but it's totally joyful work. Imagine, John, you've got to do is love everything. That's not bad. But you see, the funny thing is, it is not the verb love, because the verb love takes an object. Love who? If I love that thing in Mary, which is God, what is it that loves it? It's the thing in me, which is God, and that thing is one. In fact, the rule of the game, the statement I can also make is, if you know who you are and I know who I am, at this moment in this auditorium, there is only one of us. There is only one of us. And all these manifestations. See? And here I am. All of us. Right? Here we are. Here I am. We, I, is the same. So when you are loving, and the game again, you see, is you've got to love yourself so much that you can be loved, because it's, this, it's the sea of love. When you say, I am in love, it's like being in a tub. Come on into love. It's an extraordinary place you get. Because once you get beyond, once you see your personality even, is merely like the fenders on the Chevrolet Corvair. You understand that? All of the melodrama of the neurosis and, oh, such a problem. Wow. I mean, then mental health work is like, is like a fender repair. Because that isn't who we are anyway. Why don't we just get on with it? Everybody I meet now is the same person. How do you like that? We're all us, and here we are again. Right? You want to get caught in your melodrama groovy. But I'm going to keep centering so I don't get caught in it with you. I will love you and honor you and feel great compassion for your melodrama, but no matter how melodramatic it is, I'm not going to go on the trip this time. I'm not even going to go on my own trip. I'm not even interested in this melodrama. Because it's just another shock. It's just another drama. I've seen Peyton Place till it's coming out of my ears. Will he graduate? Will he come off drugs? Shall I give up my virginity? <laughs> Will I find a great thing in research? Will he become enlightened? What should I eat for breakfast? Should I cut my hair or let it grow? Wow, it's so heavy. Oh, God. I mean, we do it all, but let's not get caught in it. Come on now. Come on now, let's be here. You never have to miss a step. You don't have to go to the Himalayas. You don't have to drop out. You don't have to do anything. You just have to become conscious. It's as simple as that. Just get on with it. Just find a center. Until you have a center, you're just a mechanical response mechanism. You come into this class, you sit down, somebody draws a board, think this, you think that. Fifty minutes, the bell rings, you go out. You know, turn left in the maze, now eat, now. Groovy. Well, I'll make a choice. I'll have to decide whether I'm going to pursue your path or not. Come on now. More melodrama. There's no choices. There's no choices at all. You're living in a totally deterministic system. Karma is... Even the illusion of choice is just illusion. There's only freedom when you're a fully conscious being. You're not free. Choices are only apparent choices. It's all worked out. I mean, I've been hanging out with this cat in the Himalayas who knows the future. He can say, on next Tuesday, this is going to happen. How can he say that if there are any accidents in the universe? So let me say this. Let me give you one more. There are no accidents in the universe. No accident can possibly happen because any plan you can think of about how it all works, there's a plan behind that one, too. And if you get really cool in Egyptian, see, you'll dig that plan. And then there's another one just to lay a few more little things for you to play with in the ride home. <laughs> Rational man is not the highest being on the evolutionary ladder at this moment. So you can rest easy. 
And the next level of being is neither benevolent nor malevolent. So you don't have to get your ray gun to beat him off when you meet him on Mars. The physical universe as we know it is a more trivial part of the cosmos. Desire creates your universe. It is only your desire that is keeping you receiving only that information which keeps you in the illusion that there is a reality which is a physical reality. Just as if we had a television set up here and we tune it to channel 7, as far as that television is concerned, there is only channel 7. Channel 9 doesn't even exist for the television set. Now you tune it to channel 9 and suddenly channel 9 only exists for the television set and 7 doesn't exist. What happened to 7? doesn't exist. In this room at this moment there's channel 7 and there's 9 or whatever those channels are in Vancouver. But we're not receiving them because our receivers are tuned in a certain way. Because one of the qualities of the fact that you are in a human birth at this point means that your receiver was tuned a certain way. It was preset. It's preset. But it's not preset in a final way. You can adjust it. And you, I, I can sit with my guru brother, who's the guy from Laguna Beach, and he is sitting in the room right next to me, and he's talking to a guy in front of him that I don't even see. Well, one of us has lost his marbles, man. Who's crazy, him or me? I mean, there's a cat he's talking to, and the, I don't even see the guy. It's like he's tuned to channel nine, I'm tuned to channel seven. The final place one gets to is that one has a dial that is completely flexible, and you can bring in all levels at all times, and you see how it is at every level all the time. Because what, in fact, is going on is you are living at a certain vibrational rate, and that's what makes it all seem real to you. And you change that vibrational rate just a tiny bit and all this is gone and something else is here. All this is gone. Right? Somebody says to me, well, what would happen if everybody became enlightened? Well, this would all not exist because this all exists because of our desire. See how that works. But don't get scared because, you know, if you want it, you'll keep it. <laughs> That's the way it works. <laughs> No rush. We got eternity. <laughs> Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I just want you to appreciate that it turns out that the Bible is real. It's not a metaphor. It's not a, a groovy story to teach us something. It does, and it is, of course. But it's real. I mean, guys really do open the, the Red Sea and wither the fig trees. And when Christ says, had ye but faith, you could move mountains, that's true. It's all connected with vibrational rates. And once you understand the whole secret of mantra and sound and moving with different sounds and visions and visual fields and mandalas and so on, you begin to see it all falls into place and that there are just these different levels of vibrational rates. And the first level out is what's called heaven and hell in the Christian world. That's one level out. There's six more after that. But Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, if you want to go to heaven, groovy, go to heaven. It's another desire place. You want to be Lord of the Wind? Great, we'll make you Lord of the Wind. How long? 10,000 years? Sure. Now you're done with that one? Now what? Now I want to know how it all is. Groovy, we'll take you to the causal plane. Now you see how it all is. Now what? Okay. It's no rush. You've got to live out all your desires. Don't rush. It's all going to happen. Okay. It's a much bigger trip than you thought it might have been, you know. And no matter how big you get it, it's bigger than that one, too. And the way, it, it, the, way the, the Hindu system, which is, takes care of every bit of data that I ever collected in seven years of taking LSD and all the other drugs and talking to all the people who I talked to, the thousands of them, who laid their stories upon me. And then the experience with these beings in India, I suddenly, I see now about these planes of vibration or these planes of reality and see that there is a physical plane and then there is what's called an astral plane and then there is what we can call a, a causal plane. And then behind that is a place where it all is like... Um, like um, what's called negative energy or negative, you know, antimatter. Antimatter. The void. 
nirvana. Behind even antimatter, perhaps. And the first place that you come into from the void into form is the yin yang, and it's the the what's called the Godhead. It's the first consciousness. It's the highest place in the causal plane, which is the world of pure idea, and that's the mind out of which it all comes, and that's the one we really mean when we talk about God. And finally, you are that mind, you are that consciousness. And when you begin to see how your desire is creating a universe anyway, you see you already are. That's all that's going on at every level. Desire is creating the universe. At one point, I asked my teacher what LSD was, and he took about two weeks, and then he wrote back on his slate, and he said, LSD is like a Christ in America, which is awakening the young folk in Kali Yuga. America is a most materialistic country, therefore God has shown his avatar in a form of LSD, a material. They wanted a material for approaching God, and they got it in the form of LSD. A man who has not tasted things thinking as true, how he will get the feeling of those things? In other words, psychedelics show a possibility, but beyond that, you still have a lot of stuff to do. Once you've seen the possibility, you can go back and back and back to see the possibility, but that's just going back to see the possibility. Because finally, you've got to get on with it. You've got to get your scene like in order. You know what it means. Out of time, no subject object. It's pretty straight. Get your body straight. Calm your mind down. Just get on with it. You know where it is. Just do it. But you can't do it just because you think you ought to do it. You've got to do it because there's nothing else to do. The only reason I do what I do is because there's nothing else to do. Because once you've seen how it is, you might as well get on with it. What else am I going to do? I think I'll make believe there is no such thing. I think I'll go to a cocktail party. Yeah. Oh, this one again. Boy, this is a hard one. Isn't this interesting? No. How can I say it so it's scary enough to show you how real it is? I can say, I love every human being I meet as much as I've ever loved anybody in my life, and I am completely indifferent as to whether I ever see them again. I can say that when I am alone, it is quite sufficient. And when I am with somebody else, it makes no difference. How about that one? How about the one that nothing I can receive in through my senses is as high as what goes on inside? That's an interesting one. These are fierce ones, aren't they? Fierce ones. Does becoming, working towards enlightenment change your life? Of course it changes your life. It doesn't, interestingly enough, change your sense of social responsibility, but the issue of social responsibility is a very, very subtle issue because, in fact, a mechanical man cannot be very socially responsible anyway because he hasn't the least idea of what the effects of his acts are. I mean, a guy that goes charging angrily down the street, screaming for peace, is sending out a set of vibrations that are, in effect, creating war. Poor cat, he doesn't even know that. He's so busy doing his thing. He's so busy in his melodrama. It's us against them. I've seen enough Westerns. You know. Here we are. Let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. It's very heavy. Very heavy. Tatha Upanishads say, Not many hear of him, and of those not many reach him. Wonderful is he who can teach about him, and wise is he who can be taught. Wonderful is he who knows him when taught. And the last thing I will end with this evening is a poem from, that was found on a 16th century Norman crucifix. I am the great sun, but you do not see me. I am your husband, but you turn away. I am the captive, but you do not free me. I am the captain, you will not obey. I am the truth, but you will not believe me. I am that city 
where you will not stay. I am your wife, your child, but you will leave me. I am that God to whom you will not pray. I am your counsel, but you do not hear me. I am your lover that you will betray. I am your life, but if you will not name me, seal up your soul with tears and never blame me. In India, when people meet and part, they say something which is a reminder of how it is. Most of them have forgotten its meaning. They say namaste, namaste, or namaskar, namaste, which means I honor the light within you. I honor that which is the Atman, or the light or God within you. So let me say to all of us, namaste.